Good afternoon, everybody. Here with Josh and Paul and Kim Hawkins. I'll introduce you in just a minute. Uh, first, uh, COVID daily summary. We can compress this portion a little bit because the trend lines continue in a very positive direction. I'll just compare it to where we were exactly a year ago, May 20th, 2020, when we began our reopening. And now a year later, we've almost completed our reopening. Everything is open uh, in total, except for if you haven't been vaccinated, you still have to wear the mask indoors. Otherwise, we're open. Um, it's worth seeing for the first time in eight months, our positivity rate is now less than 1%, 0.93%. When we started, um, started the reopening a year ago, May um, 20th, 2020, you know, we were um, just testing more th those that had symptoms. So it's not exactly apples to apples, but it was about 9% a year ago. Hospitalizations are now down four to 141. That's our lowest in eight months, which is great. Um, back then, I think it was closer to 900 people were hospitalized a year ago. Uh, fatalities, uh, plus four, a lagging indicator. I'd like to see at least that number is continuing to go down. 57 fatalities one year ago today, that day. All right, where are we here? You remember when this map was all red and um, one of those measles maps and everybody had 15 plus cases per 100,000? I, I think this just gives you an idea. These are the 14 day moving averages, the progress we've been, been making. Um, uh, I don't want to pick on anybody, but um, it's not just cities or it's not just the smallest towns. It's a little bit of both. Putnam has probably got the... Um, highest positivity rate, still less than what everybody was, um, you know, three, two months ago. Uh, uh, as regards, Hartford is still pretty high. Waterbury, Thomaston are pretty high. Uh, the Naugatuck Valley, we're still working on a bit there. Um, Fairfield County, uh, with the exception of Norwalk, is, uh, remember, that's where we were hit the hardest a year ago. I want to know what was going on a year ago. Fairfield County was on fire. It's great to see that uh, the overwhelming majority is uh, less than five cases. Even Bridgeport's doing a lot better, so I'm really thankful for that. Vaccine update, uh, very quickly. Here's just a different way of looking at it. Um, we've got 73% or almost um, three-quarters of all of our um, adult population vaccinated. Come on, let's get over uh, three-quarters. That would make a difference. So what you see is... Um, the number of got a full dose, that's in blue, and the cross hash marks are the national average. So just briefly speaking, you can see of our seniors over the age of 65, 92% have had at least one dose. Looks like it's about, uh, you know, 5 or 7% less than that national average. 85% of all the 65 and overs are fully vaccinated, a lot less than that uh, on the national average really means 65 and overs are, um, you know, we're really close on herd immunity there. Uh, broadly speaking, um, all um, adults 18 and above, 73% at the first dose, 57% um, um, fully vaccinated. Again, looking pretty good compared to the national averages, but we still have a way to go. And I'm really pleased that the number of people getting vaccinated is not nearly what it was um, uh, two months ago, but it has stabilized a little bit. And I'm also very thankful that uh, 12 to 15 year olds are stepping up. You are getting vaccinated in one week. 20% of all the 12 to 15 year olds have been vaccinated. So um, keep it up. Uh, show your elders a thing or two. Let's change gears a little bit because we've been saying for a year that our economic health will never get back in stride until our public health is back in stride. And I think you can see that we've made enormous progress on the public health side. We're very close. If we continue the vaccinations um, ramping, uh, we're, we're gonna be in great shape for the summer and going forward. And that means um, our economy continues to grow, but we still have a way to go, but we've made good progress. Just a couple of things to look at to give you an idea of um, where we are as a state when it comes to our fiscal situation. Uh, we're going to be announcing um, any hour now that our fiscal 21 budget surplus looks like uh, $470 million. Uh, that's on top of a surplus last year as well. 
So that doesn't happen very often in the state. Um, people are getting to pay attention. Our rainy day fund is still fully um, throttled at three plus billion dollars. That's the 15 percent of the total. That's uh, uh, extraordinary. And all that on top of $6 billion we are getting from the federal government. I'm going to talk in just a minute about what we plan to do with this money to make transformative changes in our state. But it just as a reminder of, A, how much money we have to put to work, why I believe we don't need any uh, new taxes or tax increases. And I think people are beginning to recognize that. Um, you probably saw at the end of last week we have three more credit rating agencies, uh, Kroll, S&P, Moody's. Fitch, um, Ford total, all of whom upgraded Connecticut. Um, we're not out of the woods. We still have uh, big pension obligations and um, long-term fixed costs, uh, but we are making um, slow but steady progress. And one way to measure that is paying down debt. You may say, oh, what does that mean? Um, well, that means it looks like we're going to pay down about $1.4 billion in debt in this fiscal year, 1.4, making a fundamental difference in terms of um, our outstanding liabilities, uh, given our seniors a little more confidence that the money is there when they retire, and giving taxpayers some confidence that um, we're making a difference in terms of pensions. What does 1.4 billion mean? Because we have a, you know tens of billions of outstanding liabilities, but it still saves us about $115 million a year. So for all those years that, you know, Hartford was not making contributions to the pension fund and our annual obligation ramped up once we started doing it, now for the first time, because of the uh, $1.4 billion, it's going to save you in the, ne in the coming years and future governors and taxpayers about $115 million a year. So that makes a big difference. Uh, let's keep it up. And in addition, um, you know, hats off to... Um, the Treasurer, we had about a 17% rate of return on our um, pension funds. Um, uh, i tell you the truth, the stock market had a lot to do with that. We've done very well, so have they. But if we underperform our 7% um, uh, rate of return estimate, uh, that would have meant we had to contribute even more in pension funding, more in actually required contribution. We're doing less. So that means either more money to keep in your pockets or more money to invest in making a difference for people. What are we doing to try and make a difference for people? Um, I just wanted to tell you that we're going to have well over a billion dollars invested in transformative differences in people's lives, doing everything we can, A, on economic opportunity, on B, on economic growth, to get this uh, economy growing again. The public health merits it. Now we've got to um, really make that as an emphasis. And these are some of our priorities with $1 billion that we're going to invest over the next three years. Uh, you know, first and foremost, I always remember the kids. And um, even our kids were disproportionately hit. They were most likely to... Um, you know, missed out uh, on much of the year despite our best efforts. We want to do everything we can to help them catch up and help their moms, help their parents catch up. Well, number one, we've got in our budget home visiting for the first time ever. You get a visit from a home health care nurse um, prenatal, at birth, and uh, a couple of months after birth. I want to make sure we're there at the very beginning. We know what a difference that early intervention can make, not simply in terms of uh, learning, but also in terms of health. And we've learned a lot about health disparities and how black and brown people were disproportionately hit by COVID. And a lot of that is due to comorbidities, some of which happen at an early age. Child care expansion. I think we've talked about this before. The largest expansion of a daycare and child care in the history of the state. What that means, A, for kids getting um, back on their feet and allowing their parents, allowing their single mom now with their good care for their kids at a very affordable rate, free if you can't afford it, allows you to get back to work as well. The uh, summer learning camps fall in that same category. We're ramping that up, working very closely with the mayors and superintendents, see if they will match the state's effort there. You know, then we can really make sure it's of a, you know, virtually no cost to anybody who can't afford it and help our kids back with learning, fun learning, 
fun learning at the Mystic Aquarium, at the Norwalk Aquarium, or, or museums and the such, as well as some learning and socialization. Um, Debt-free community college. We've uh, doubled our contribution there um, using, in this case, federal monies to do that. I want to make sure that nobody is denied um, access to a better education, higher education. K through 12 by itself doesn't do it for 90% of jobs anymore. It makes an enormous difference in your life to keep going. So we've also got scholarship programs, the Roberta Willis program. I've got to work with the um, legislature on that to make uh, higher ed more affordable and keep our community colleges debt free for the foreseeable future. Give you an opportunity. Expanding health care for everybody, making health care more affordable. This current budget cycle, uh, we're going to have the largest expansion of Obamacare since Obama. And uh, it's going to mean that um, over half of our population will now be eligible on the exchange, on the Obamacare exchange to get a pretty good health insurance at less than $16 a month. And over and above that, um, I know that uh, there are sometimes the co-pays, sometimes the deductibles that can make the premiums affordable, but the health care is not affordable. We have a plan on the table to provide $50 million in subsidies for those uh, working families that need help with the co-pays and deductibles to make sure that our great expansion on the exchange with help from um, you know, President Biden is going to uh, greatly expand health care access for everybody, and what a difference that can make. Uh, over on the other side, um, look, I'll just do this quickly, uh, an expansion of affordable housing. We're doing that a couple of different ways, not just in terms of rent relief and other subsidies that we're getting from uh, the federal government. They're also giving us about $56 million to add um, new affordable housing, which we're going to take advantage of. On top of that, I'm working with the legislature. We want to make a three, five-year commitment so people know what our commitment to affordable housing is, especially affordable housing in downtown, transit-oriented development, and allow more people to live near where they work or at least live next to a commuting spot so they can get to work without having to jump into a car. Um, criminal justice. Uh, jumping around a little bit, environmental justice, criminal justice, uh, making a real effort in terms of um, more access to public defenders. Our courts have been closed for a long time. There are issues regarding, um, you know, landlord issues, tenant issues, and we're going to make sure that you have right to access that you need so you have a, rep a good representation going forward. Environmental justice, another big investment here. We're doing this out of our Transportation Climate Initiative. But look at the number of poor people. Look at the number of, um, you know, underserved minorities that live next to a place that is um, environmentally uh, risky. You know, we know about Mira. We know about the trash to energy plant. We're closing that down and replacing that. We know about the people that live near highways and what that does to asthma rates and how asthma was such a, a predictor of what could happen in COVID. These are the type of uh, environmental and criminal justice investments we're making out of this $1 billion three-year commitment. And these are investments we want to make, show that they work. Uh, we want to make sure that um, not only are you getting education, but we're also training you for jobs that are out there right now. We have tens of thousands of jobs. And included in that workforce development, as you know, is the certificate program of the community colleges at absolutely no cost to you. Uh, programs that are being created by, with help from our local businesses, jobs that are out there. You get this 16-week program, you're ready to go. Um, these are all the opportunities we have with the federal money, the state money, and as well as bonding. And, uh, you know, the Founding Fathers called states the laboratories of democracy. And uh, for the first time in many a year, we have the resources really to make some innovative investments, experiments to show what works. And if at the end of year two, we're able to show that this historic commitment in daycare, for example, made a difference, or criminal justice or expanding mental health support made a difference. We talked with President Biden yesterday. These are the type of things he'd like to see the federal government step in and continue if we can show the investments worked, type of things we as a state should continue to invest in if we can show these investments work. Um, and finally, on top of workforce development and training we provide, um, we also want to make sure there's capital. 
capital for folks uh, to start up a business. We lost uh, hundreds of businesses. Many took advantage of the PPP loans, took advantage of other federal supports and state loans we had to keep things going. But here's an opportunity with Workforce to give you some of the training you need. And now with our um, equity investment fund for small businesses, with a real focus on underserved uh, communities, an opportunity for you to have uh, the capital you need to help start up um, uh, place pl businesses where there might be a real need within your very community. And um, that takes me back to HEDCO. That takes me back um, to somebody who has been very involved here for um, some time. HEDCO is, is the um, Hartford Economic Development, but they do a lot more than Hartford. They work in underserved communities around the state. And it's going to be uh, working with partners like Kim Hawkins at HEDCO that we hope to take this uh, $300 million equity investment fund, not just provide loans, but also provide some of the equity capital people need to help start up a business right in their community. Kim, you have a little experience with this. Any thoughts? Certainly do. Uh, thank you, Governor, for allowing me the opportunity to speak. Uh, you know, as we look at uh, the, these new um, opportunities that are coming forward. Uh, let me step back and just say Headco is an alternative lender. We've been in the business for 45 years of working with small businesses to provide them with either access to capital or training. And as a part of that, we have partnered with the state of Connecticut to provide these opportunities for businesses to be able to grow and develop and to build on uh, resources that they didn't necessarily have available to them. So when we we talk about this tranche of dollars that is going to come down. Um, it provides a wonderful opportunity for us to be able to work within the communities as we have done in the past. But also when we talk about equity building, that's one of the things that we know that businesses need. Um, coming through the pandemic, we know that businesses aren't going to be able to uh, take on additional debt. As you said, they've gotten PPP and other grants, but there needs to be other opportunities to have infusion of capital and, and opportunities opportunities to be able to support themselves a little bit differently. And this allows us that opportunity. We work with businesses that employ either uh, anywhere from one to 20 um, individuals. And, you know, we, we run the gamut. We, we work with daycares. We work with contractors, elder care, home health care, small bodegas in the neighborhood, salons, barbers, restaurants, manufacturers. Um, and so when you hear that, you hear that those are businesses that are really based in the communities and they're what help keep the communities thriving, keep the uh, community um, employing uh, residents in that community. And it just makes for a better opportunity for us to continue to grow, develop and build communities. So we're, we're excited about the opportunity to partner with the state and other others around the state to be able to really be supportive of the small businesses uh, through this pivot. We know that we, as you said, lost businesses, but there's opportunity for new business growth. And so we're looking forward to being able to be a part of that, to be able to uh, set the, the plans for that and just watch our businesses flourish, um, come back, bounce back from what we've experienced over the last year and a half. So as I said, we're excited about that. We know that there's work to be done, but we know that we can get in there and get it done um, with these resources that are now going to be available. And it just means being creative in terms of how we go about deploying these services and the resources to make sure that we're able to sustain our businesses. Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to do, be able to have viable, sustainable businesses that are functioning in our communities and, uh, and providing employment for the residents of those communities. Beautifully said. So we're providing some of the training and expertise you need. You know where the market is and the opportunity. And uh, thanks to folks like Kim, we're going to have access to capital to make some investments that make a difference. Any questions? Josh and Paul are here, of course. NBC Connecticut. Hi, Governor. It's Catherine Loy with NBC. Um, the Department of Labor today announced that starting May 30th, they're going to require job seekers to provide proof of, of searching for work again. Can you why they decided to re-implement that at this time? 
Uh, I, I think right now there are a fair number of jobs that are out there, and um, you know, following the lead of the President of the United States, it's important that pe people on unemployment um, also be known that they should be looking for jobs. And as you've heard from Kim, there are a lot of opportunities out there. Working with Indeed and other partners, we can help direct you to where some of those jobs are. We also have a $1,000 signing bonus, so I think it's a good time to make sure people are looking for jobs. And when it comes to recent college Obviously, you know, yesterday we had the Coast Guard Academy graduation. This is the time of year people are graduating for college. Are you talking about any sort of incentives to try to keep those younger workers in the state instead of leaving as they go, you know, to pursue their careers? Well, the uh, Coast Guard uh, ensigns, they go overseas pretty fast. But um, in terms of other incentives, I think the best incentives we have is uh, the best state when it comes to child care and uh, family values. I think the best incentive we have is good job opportunities right now and matching your skills with the jobs that are there. If you're asking me whether we you know, pay money to keep people around, I don't think we have to do that. I think there's enough opportunity right here in Connecticut. Um, and, and last question. The vice president come to Connecticut. We saw the president come to Connecticut yesterday. Uh, is that something we can expect to see more of during uh, these next four years? I think they like Connecticut, and they're welcome any time. Okay, thank you. News 8. Hey, Governor, I just wanted to follow up on that first question about unemployment. Is there reason to believe that people are not seeking a job right now who are collecting unemployment? I don't, th I don't think that's as big a problem. Our, our $1,000 is meant to help people. Maybe they have some transportation needs. Maybe they have some child care needs. Uh, but you're right. There are some people that were, um, their families or their extended families were hit hard, hit hard by COVID. So there's still some COVID anxiety out there, which I think is uh, meaningful. So we're trying to address all those concerns. I know people are worried about the extra $300 the federal government gives you. Um, that's over in a few months. So this is the time right now to be thinking about that job. And my other question is, uh, right now, do you prefer the consumption tax speaker's bonding plan for the cities and the state budget? Uh, well, first of all, it's not a consumption tax. It's just an income tax by another name. And I've been pretty clear that um, I think I just demonstrated the amount of money we're putting to work right now with existing funds that I don't think we... Um, need to raise taxes. Uh, the bonding, let me take a look at it. I'm, I, I'm sympathetic to bonding in terms of economic growth, development, and opportunities. So um, when it comes to affordable housing, when it comes to brownfields, when it comes to the type of things that help our economy grow and make for opportunity, yeah, let's take a look at it. My last question here. Um, the Department of Labor is reporting that we have only recovered six out of every 10 jobs right now in the state. Do we have a goal as to when we want to be at 10 out of 10 jobs? Do we know when uh, we would like possible. this to happen? As soon as possible. Look, the service economy uh, came back a little more slowly. Um, and people didn't feel really comfortable. I think they feel pretty comfortable now going to the restaurants. I've been to a few restaurants. I don't see uh, many shy consumers there, but we still have a way to go. I'd like to think by the end of this year, we're uh, close to full throttle. Okay, thank you. Channel 3 Eyewitness News. Uh, yes, Governor, you know, you mentioned that we have 20% of the 12 to 16-year-olds who are already vaccinated. Was this the enthusiasm that you were expecting to see? Like, are we meeting those? I think it's pretty good. I mean, if uh, if I heard the age group right, they've only had an opportunity for a week, um, at least the 12 to 15, the 20 percent. Uh, I think I'm a little more concerned about the 20 to 35 year old uh, age group. Uh, maybe that has not gone quite as fast as uh, we might have hoped, the so-called invincibles. Um, hopefully uh, they're going to take advantage of the uh, drinks on us uh, opportunity. We'll see some ramp up there. Josh, do you have any other thoughts on that? No, I, I just to echo, I think uh, we're all really pleased. I think it's a fast start in the first week, 20% of that entire population already with their first dose. Uh, so we look forward to seeing continued momentum there. And a real quick question about graduations. Just wanted to see how they're going to be handled. You know, will venues need to have capacity and mask policies in place because this is a... Go ahead, Josh. Yeah, so... Uh... 
our state department of education is working with our superintendents and districts around um you know how to make sure that these end of year major milestone events are, are conducted safely and in most cases uh, as the governor's mentioned previously we're going to kind of stay the course for the rest of this, the school year in terms of indoor masking um and when it comes to graduation events obviously it depends a lot whether it's indoors or outdoors but it's going to be very town by town they're going to be working on their own protocols based on the venue the event's going to be at but it's certainly going to be you know much much more um well attended uh and hopefully much closer to normal graduation event than we than we had last year got it but it will be up to the towns towns will have the final say that's correct thank you very much fox 61 Hi there, Governor. You know, we've been hearing from business owners who are saying that they have been having a hard time hiring employees unemployment benefits offered. You know, you had mentioned that $300 running out in a couple months. Ohio has decided to stop receiving the extra federal unemployment benefits in June. Does Connecticut have any plans to do that to maybe motivate people to go back to work? Well, that $1,000 was supposed to be... Um least helpful in terms of uh, getting people back to work. But I wouldn't jump to conclusions. We're just coming out of a pretty severe pandemic. A lot of people were hit hard. A lot of people um, lost someone they loved. Uh, so I think, especially in this part of the country, there are a variety of reasons why some people aren't rushing back to work. But uh, I'm doing everything I can to give them a nudge. Thank you. And this is another question about reopening and seeing if you have any guidance from the state. With this mask mandate dropped, we know many businesses are using the honor system about whether or not you're vaccinated in order to see whether or not you're wearing your mask. But we've had a lot of viewers ask us and what is not legal when it comes to asking a person if they are vaccinated. Uh, I see no uh, reason why... Um each uh, store, each business, each cruise line, each airline, they all have the right to um, uh, have different sets of parameters. Obviously, the cruise lines, uh, they, you know, you saw how they were hit severely by COVID a little over a year ago. So they have uh, vaccinated only cruises in many cases. Florida says, no, you cannot ask somebody whether they've been vaccinated. So Carnival Cruise Line says, great, we're not going to stop in Florida. I think you see a lot of the sports arenas, they have vaccinated and unvaccinated areas. So they are feeling free to ask um, as they see fit to make their customers feel more comfortable and confident going back. I think you're gonna probably see some of the same thing in restaurants and stores where different um, you know, vendors uh, elect to do it different ways because they know their uh, business and their customers as well as anybody. You heard Stu Leonard's thinking out loud about it, but the, your, the question to your answer is, um, the answer to your question, they have the discretion to do what they think is right to keep people safe and to get people back to their stores. Thank you. WTIC 1080 News. WTIC 1080. early returns on CT drinks on us. How many restaurants have signed up? Uh, hundreds. I don't have a number, though. Do you, Josh? I was well over 200 uh, as of uh, yesterday. And it's not too late to sign up. So if you're a restaurant out there, you still like to get on the list, let us know. We'll put you on there. And what are doctors telling you about the path of this virus? I know we talked a lot about it when the numbers were on the way up. Now that they're you know, almost zero, are you confident with the vaccinations and the entire scenario that it will stay this, this way, or are we still at risk down the road for surges? I feel very talking to, um, you know, Scott and uh, Dr. Ko and Zeke and a lot of folks that we compare notes to. I feel very confident for this summer. I, I think there's a certain seasonality to it as long as con people continue to get vaccinated. If I have some slight concerns, it's more what happens in the fall where seasonality flu can pick up a little bit, a little more time for India and Brazil variants to percolate, uh, which is just reasons number 13, 14, and 15. If everybody's vaccinated, there's no way for those variants to replicate. The Associated Press. Thanks, Max. Good afternoon. 
Uh, Governor, uh, Sport Tech, the OTB vendor, is today is questioning the constitutionality of the gambling agreement that your office reached with the tribes. And in the same, and it's up for a vote tonight in the House. At the same time, they put out a statement saying that they are negotiating with your office a, quote, solution that benefits all parties. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about what the solution might be with Sport Tech? I'll start, and then I'll pass it right over to Paul. But, um, look, as you know, we have a longstanding compact with the tribes. So they are first in line when it comes to sports betting and iGaming, and, and they got their rights to get going on that, which is really important. Obviously, we with the lottery have the same opportunities to get going. It's really important. Timing is important. I'm glad the legislature is taking it up. But remember, the lottery has a number of skins. Right? You know, we don't do this ourselves. We contract with others like a sport tech to take care of sports betting in, um, you know, different situations. So I hope they take advantage of that. But, Paul, keep going. Thanks, Governor. Yeah, we've, um, as you know, within the construct of the bill that's going to be taken up by the House later tonight, it does provide for the lottery to enter into negotiations and discussions uh, with uh, sports tech uh, as it deals with uh, having sports betting happen at a brick and mortar facility on their various locations. Uh, obviously, uh, with any facility, you have to make sure you have the proper zoning and proper approvals. Well, Sports Tech, as the paramutual partner of the state of Connecticut for many years, already has that. So I know that the chairman of the lottery, as well as the executive director of the lottery, has been speaking directly to the CEO of Sports Tech. Uh, myself and Nora Danahy have had discussions uh, with uh, Sports Tech CEO directly. But at this time, um, they're, they're just continuing forward with the current contract that the bill is, that they can enter into uh, direct negotiations and discussions with the Connecticut lottery at this time. So, Paul, there's nothing beyond what's in that uh, language of the bill then, right? The bill is the bill, and we look forward to it uh, passing uh, with overwhelming support in the House and look forward to its uh, a swift approval also in the Senate so the governor can sign it. We can start the compact amendment, send it over down to the Department of Interior down in D.C. and be able to have uh, sports gaming up and going uh, before our, some of our neighbors uh, this fall. On another negotiation, uh, the SCIU, the nursing home union that also represents the group home workers, they today pulled their strike notices to strike at 200 group homes on Friday. And they said that they were heartened by some discussions they're having with you, Governor, regarding a funding package for them. Could you please talk a little bit about that? Why don't you keep going, Paul? Oh, thanks, Governor. Uh, the governor has asked uh, myself and Secretary McCall to uh, lead uh, discussions when it comes to both the nursing home uh, situation as well as the assisted living uh, situation uh, where the workers are represented by SEIU 1199 uh, Connecticut New England. We had very fruitful and productive discussions when it came to the nursing homes. So when it came to the assisted living facilities uh, where there are still uh, work that's being done on the nursing home side, uh, we wrote a letter to them yesterday um, uh, on behalf of the governor asking, since we have been working in close collaboration with each other, uh, that in, or in order for all parties to have enough time to evaluate uh, various uh, funding options uh, and also to uh, have discussions with the legislature that they will postpone uh, their strike notice that was supposed to be set for tomorrow. Uh, as always, they have to go back to their workers to get approval and they got that approval. We really thank uh, Rob Burrill, uh, the leader of uh, SEIU uh, Connecticut, uh, for putting not only his workers first, but also uh, the individuals that they care for first uh, by postponing uh, that strike notice yet for tomorrow. Paul, I just want to correct. You meant um, group homes, not group assisted homes. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, because these are for sorry, people Sue. with disabilities, right? Yes, I'm sorry, Sue. You, Sue. Okay. Yes, I meant group homes. Thank you. Okay. Um, and this, I just had one more quick question regarding the COVID numbers. Uh, they are much, much better, but we still see like five or more people, four people a, a day dying. Do we know like what the age ranges are, what the circumstances are of, of these deaths? Josh, do you have a breakout on that? Yeah. Um, one, one important thing to remember is that, as the governor mentioned earlier, that the data here often does lag. So oftentimes the deaths that get reported to the State Department of Public Health 
may have occurred, you know, days or, or even sometimes weeks ago. So there is, you know, a lag associated with that. But the one thing we do know, Sue, uh, is that nearly all of the people that have died over the last several months from COVID-19 were unvaccinated. That is the common denominator. And uh, unfortunately, we still have people at most age groups, even at 92% of our seniors vaccinated, obviously means there's still 8% that are not. And those people remain at, at very high risk for uh, severe illness and death from this virus. And so um, it's just another important reminder to everyone who has not yet been vaccinated to go get vaccinated, because that's how you, you protect yourself, your community, um, and, uh, and help us get those uh, death numbers down to zero, hopefully as soon as possible. Great. Thanks a lot, you guys. The Day of New London. Hi, everyone. Uh, Governor, what are your thoughts on the president's speech at the Coast Guard Academy yesterday? And um, did you have time to speak with him before or after the fact? I thought it was pretty impressive. I mean, um, he was out there for close to three hours, um, shook every hand, interestingly, um, delivered the uh, diplomas. Um, I thought he gave a, a pretty interesting speech, and we did have a chance to catch up uh, briefly afterwards, yes. Hey, Jez, you can tell me what you guys talked about. <laughs> yeah, um, I told him how uh, the American Rescue Plan was really important, uh, not just as a support services for people in need, but about getting people back to work, how child care is also about getting people back to work. I told him about the $1,000 um, incentive bonus we have, and um, well, jury's out, see how big a difference that makes. He was very interested in that as well. Thanks. And last thing for you, um, you talked about, um, you know, that the state will be monitoring these federal investments um, and trying to prove they work in order to make them recurring. Uh, how do you plan to do that? I guess, how do you plan to show um, the federal government that these investments have worked? Yeah, uh, well, obviously, we have a wide variety um, workforce. How many people got a job? And uh, was, was that an investment that paid off? I think that's uh, easier to measure. Child care expansion, you know, intuitively we understand what it means to kids and what it means to uh, single parents, helping them get back to work. Uh, but we'd like to be able to see if we can have some measurement to show what a difference that made. Maybe talking to uh, schools two or three years later to see what difference, if any, their entering class had going forward. Um, obviously, the equity investment fund um, is really um, demonstrable. Maybe not in two years, to, to be blunt, Stan, but uh, at least be able to see these are investments that made a difference. At least by two years, we can see whether it was a flop or whether they stabilize. It looks like it's a, um, a business that can be on the go. So um, what I meant to say was everybody says, hey, what happens? Fund everything for the long term now. But I think our strategy, and I believe the president's strategy is, let's see what works, and we'll double down on things that work, maybe not things that don't work. Okay, thank you. The Waterbury Republican American. Uh, thanks, Max. Um, I was just, you know, the, uh, the status alert map looks like the Naugatuck Valley hotspot has uh, cooled down. What, what do you guys attribute that to? Want to try that, Josh? Um, it has, and it, as it has around the state. Um, so I think overall, as we've seen uh, cases come down across the state, um, you know, that helps. Uh, we're a small state, so people live and work in different places. I think the overall dynamics are very positive. More people are getting vaccinated as well, Paul, as you've seen those numbers ticking up in some of those areas that had lower vaccination rates. That definitely makes a big difference as well. And uh, you know, there's been huge efforts put in, particularly in Waterbury, the mayor and the, and the team there, been great partners with, you know, very well attended uh, mobile clinics over the last several weeks, uh, getting more people vaccinated. So, you know, that, that all those efforts help. Okay. And I was just doing some uh, quick math, um, uh, and I hope I'm right, uh, but you never know. Um, it looks like since uh, the beginning of May, there's been about a 25% increase in the number of fully vaccinated people, but just a sort of 8% increase in the number of uh, first shots administered. I would imagine as more people get vaccinated, we would see that number go down. But uh, are there anything else? Uh, what other factors do you think are in that sort of... Um, I don't know if discrepancy is the right word, but there certainly is a difference there. 
that a discrepancy? Obviously, the people getting the second shot, they got their first shot three and four weeks ago when people were um, – a little more eager to get vaccinated. Now we've got, uh, we're slowing down the number of new vaccinations. We've got to be more creative all the time to incent people to get vaccinated. Uh, it's not simply a matter of here's a mass vaccination center and they will come. So that's why that, that first shot has uh, gone down a little bit over the last few weeks. And uh, do you anticipate using uh, the state's high vaccination rate as a sort of uh, tourism marketing peg? That's interesting. I hadn't really focused on that, but um, look, you want to come to a state where uh, people are vaccinated? Um, I would, and uh, so I think, um, I'm not sure I'll put that right in the TV ad, though, Paul. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> and, uh, you know, why are people talking, when we talk about um, the employment situation and getting people back to work, um, you know, why aren't people talking about employers perhaps not being willing to raise wages? I mean, could that be a, a, a detriment? I mean, yeah, there's a market for um, work. And uh, right now there's uh, a lot of jobs out there that don't seem to be paying quite enough to uh, entice people who have maybe a little COVID hesitant to get back in. We're helping with a thousand dollar incentive, but I think you're absolutely right. I think you'll see some of those base wages go up to uh, meet the, uh, the demand. And uh, Josh, how do we do with the, uh, the, uh, High risk, uh, the SBI zip codes this week. I think we were uh, 1% off uh, the last two weeks. So, Yeah, we did uh, 31% last week, um, okay. which was the, the target. We're going to move the target up to 32% as we add the 12 to 15-year-olds. Um, okay. That's the new uh, portion of uh, the population that lives in those high SBI zip codes down to the age well. And uh, is there any, uh, do you have any of the updated information on the sort of the booster shot planning for... Uh, you know, nursing homes and other congregate settings. It's been a few weeks since uh, I think we last discussed that. Well, if you're if you're referring to uh, booster shots for fully vaccinated people, um, there's no new news there. We'll follow you know the CDC and the FDA and their guidance in the coming months. Um, nothing new there. If you're if you're referring to our program and our efforts to ensure that we're continuing to vaccinate. Uh, new admissions uh, to our nursing homes, our assisted living facilities. That that work continues um, in strong partnership with uh, hospitals uh, who are uh, doing a good job of uh, vaccinating uh, discharges uh, headed to nursing homes and assisted living facilities. And um, uh, through our pr Operation Matchmaker, where uh, State Department of Public Health is continuing to work with uh, facility operators to make sure they're paired up with uh, pharmacies or other vaccinating partners to ensure that second doses get administered as needed or that first doses get administered as well if the individual's not coming from a, uh, a hospital. But the reality is, fortunately, there's very few people left in the state uh, in those older age groups who are not yet vaccinated, but we're going to continue to stay on top of it to make sure we don't see the, the very high vaccination rates amongst residents uh, drift downwards over time. Okay, so you're just waiting on the, on the federal guidance to see what... Um if any booster shots might be required for the nursing home population. I know there was some talk about folks getting, you know, vaccinated in December and may need a boost um, later this uh, later this year. So, okay. Nothing new there. Okay, thank you very much. The Hartford Current. Hi, everybody. I um, wanted to ask, first of all, about uh, outreach to uh, kids 12 to 15, because we've seen, um, at least in some populations, how hard it's been to get um, adults uh, to show up for vaccination. And it seems like in some ways um, children would be even more tricky. So um, as we get past this phase where sort of the, the anxious people are getting vaccinated, what are the plans to do kind of proactive outreach to that? Well, for starters, Alex, we're working very closely with the schools, and uh, the schools um, have great outreach to the parents. Obviously, this is an age group where you need a parental uh, permission, probably even um, a parent to drive you there. And I think uh, that collaboration is working. At some point, maybe even be able to bring more and more of the vaccines right to the schools. Josh, anything else? Yeah, the, the other um, important uh, 
uh, element of this, Alex, that's worth mentioning is, is the work that our State Department of Public Health is doing with, with doctors and pediatricians in particular. A lot of the data shows that, um, particularly amongst people who are still on the fence about whether they want to get vaccinated, um, doctors, their, their, their physician or, or a medical professional that they have a trusted relationship with can be the most helpful in terms of answering their questions and uh, addressing any remaining concerns they might have. That's certainly true as well for for children and their parents, who are obviously the key decision makers in, in that in that next step as well. So we're working with um, uh, primary care practices um, and pediatricians to um, uh, enable them to provide vaccine um, at routine visits. Um, as you know, Alex, these vaccines often have um, uh, somewhat onerous uh, storage requirements. They come in large quantities. Um, so we're also working to set up uh, partnerships to uh, break down some of the large quantities and distribute them to primary care physicians in smaller quantities that they can administer uh, more quickly uh, and address some of the barriers that have made that challenging for them in the past. So that's a, that's a um, distribution uh, channel that we see as a, an important one in the coming months, certainly for younger children through their pediatricians, uh, but for the population generally that, that still hasn't been vaccinated as well. Got it. And uh, I also wanted to check in on the uh, rollout of the, you put out the call for anybody to request a vaccine van at their, um, at their whatever, their organization, their neighborhood. Um, have you gotten a lot of feedback on that or how has that process gone? Yeah, we, we've uh, we've gotten I think about a dozen uh, uh, requests. We're gonna we're gonna fulfill them all. Um, one worth noting is there's a Juneteenth uh, event, a celebration being planned in Bridgeport down at Seaside Park um, that we're gonna send a van to. It sounds like they're gonna have a big crowd there. We're really excited about that. Uh, others include uh, some churches uh, have requested uh, libraries uh, and others. So uh, again, would encourage people if you'd like to get one of those yellow. Uh, DPH Griffin vans uh, to your event. Uh, there's a form you can find on our uh, ct.gov COVID slash COVID vaccine website where you can re request a van. And finally, Governor, do you plan on going out for a free drink um, now that you're vaccinated? I sure do. Where are you going to go? You'll find out. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Thank you. Hearst, Connecticut Media. Hey, Governor, um, I was hoping you could expand on the guidance that was released earlier by um, the Department of Education on uh, when students and teachers can go mask to that side. Uh, is, it, is it going to be universal or will this be up to districts to decide uh, whether or not kids can wear a mask outside? Josh, you can answer that more precisely. Yeah, so education um, has issued additional guidance to districts um, uh, in the last 24 hours, I believe, that um, clarifies that, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to stay the course on indoor masking for the rest of the school year. We're almost there. The formula has worked well. And uh, nearly all those children are unvaccinated still at this point. Even the 12 to 15-year-olds who are getting vaccinated right now, they're not going to be fully vaccinated with that second dose and then the subsequent two weeks until the school year is over. So we're going to keep that going. With regards to outdoors, so recess, mask breaks, et cetera, um, uh, we've clarified for districts that it will be okay for children to take masks off outside. Um, if they're going to be in, in small groups when they're coming and going uh, close to each other in and out, they should keep their masks on. But once they're outside, uh, playing, um, uh, the masks are no longer required. Thanks, and then Governor, um, New York uh, has started up a voluntary digital pass system. Uh, do you have any more appetite for that in Connecticut now that we're, um, we've dropped all the other remaining business restrictions? Look, if I had, um, you know, businesses and others saying, boy, it'd really be handy if a state came in and helped make sure some digital platform was in place, we'd take a look at it. I haven't gotten that request, though. I think most businesses are able to do it themselves. And then also, um, what's your take on mask etiquette for people? If you've been fully vaccinated, is it is it polite to still wear a mask uh, when you go to the supermarket or, you know, under your local Walmart? Oh, that's a good question. Look, I think if you're fully vaccinated, um, look, if you're next to somebody um, really close, uh, I think maybe I'd put on my mask. Uh, this is just personally speaking, even though I'm vaccinated. So there's no uh, great risk there just to make the other person feel more comfortable or, um, 
You know, I like to think that they're wearing a mask if they're unvaccinated, but you're never 100 percent sure, are you? So I think uh, I'll err on the side of caution a little longer, and I think most people are as well. I went to a service today in a church, and nobody said it, but everybody wore a mask. All right, one more quick one. Uh, Do you plan to sign the ice cream truck safety bill? I think I do, yes. CT News Junkie. Thanks, Max. Uh, Josh, I... Real quick, I wanted to follow up on something Sue was asking about a little bit ago. Uh, you were saying that that um, the she was talking about age, the age range of the deaths that's still occurring. You you were saying that the oldest bracket is something like ninety two percent vaccinated at this point. Are we are deaths now skewing younger, or is that a phenomenon we've seen at all? Well, from back before we started vaccinating our seniors, uh, certainly, you know, the vast, you know, I think uh, uh, 96% of the deaths in the state are among, uh, since the pandemic began, are among people 55 and older. Um, since we started vaccinating our seniors and prioritized based on age, as you, as you recall, um, the death rates among the older population slowed dramatically and, and rapidly. Um, so uh, the, the people who've still been dying from COVID uh, tend to still be on the older side, um, you know, above 55 years old for the most part, um, where we still, unfortunately, still have a uh, you know, number of people who are unvaccinated. Okay. Uh, Governor, how would you characterize the um, budget negotiations that started today? Uh, well, Melissa was in um, for many hours uh, with appropriations, and I think they're having very constructive uh, dis- discussions. Um, Look, I think broadly speaking, um, all parties want to say as we come out of COVID, we want to make some transformative investments. We've realized and we've been reminded unto a number of times how um, certain populations, black and brown populations, have been disproportionately hit. You see that reflected in health. You see that reflected in education. Do what we can to help these folks in any way that we can going forward. And also, just not just economic opportunity, but economic growth. I think there's some shared priorities. How exactly you slice up the appropriations, um, Melissa and Paul will get back to you on that. But I think we're making good progress. Uh, one of the appropriations chairs yesterday uh, said she was shooting, hoping to have it wrapped up by the end of May. Do you think that's plausible? What's your bet on when we uh, put this that. to bed? This I week? like that. I mean, uh, we've had in years past. Um, these budgets go into September, October. Um, we don't need any of that. Uh, I think we've got a pretty smooth operation going. I think we have the resources to take care of um, what we've got to do as a priority, and I'd like to think we can do something in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, one last thing. As COVID rates continue to drop um, and the session's about three weeks out, what's the plan? Is there any decision for these little uh, Monday, Thursday get-togethers here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Obviously, COVID is not changing in a way that was um, uh, particularly imperative uh, going back the last year. Uh, There's a lot going on in this building for another couple of weeks. So I'll ask you, Hugh. I mean, we can keep going in this process. We take questions, get people's answers, maybe a little less COVID and a little more um, getting our economy moving, getting getting a budget uh, signed. And we can do it just for probably another couple of weeks, if I had to guess. All right, Governor. Thank you. Connecticut Public Media. We've seen a lot of crime in cities throughout Connecticut in the past week. And although like summer is historically a worse time for crime, do you fear that it might be worse as the state has reopened and people might be in worse financial and mental states than last year, and is part of the $1 million that you previously mentioned in this press conference going towards anything that might help prevent some of the violence going on? You know, absolutely. Um, I think you're right on all those fronts. Uh, Obviously, there's a certain seasonality to crime. I think it's particularly pronounced this year um, in Connecticut and, and really in other every other state, and particularly in the bigger cities. I think a lot of that is related to the fact that, um, I don't know, what's going on? Everybody's out there buying a gun. I think that's part of uh, the issue. I think a lot of people have been pent up for a long time. I think there are some um, stress, mental health, addiction-related issues. And, uh, yes, we're putting money, um, 
you know, more on the mental health, more on the project longevity, more on ways that we can help support the police with the social service uh, piece of what they got to do to make sure we take care of these issues before they become a gun shooting. Thank you. The Connecticut Mirror. Thanks, Max. Uh, Non-COVID question first. Um, Governor, the House has been debating uh, for most of the day some zoning reform bills. Uh, just curious on how much you've been monitoring that or what are your thoughts on that? And I noticed in the slides you put up earlier that part of the billion dollars would go to affordable housing. Do you have any specifics on that yet or where that what what might be offered by the state for that? Yeah, Dave, um, uh, we're, we're following that carefully. I think um, affordable housing is more of a priority today than, you know, it's it's ever been. I think we were reminded how important um, housing and shelter is over this last year. Uh, the federal money we got has got $56 million for affordable housing. Obviously, we're working aggressively on rent relief, um, working with tenants and landlords, making sure people can stay in their homes. And uh, I care very much about, um, you know, transit-oriented development, getting affordable housing in uh, downtown areas. But that said, I also like the fact that um, you've got the accessory apartment um, piece of the zoning bill being considered by the legislature right now. There are thousands of additional units at, um, uh, attached to homes all over the state, not just in the cities, but in the suburban and small towns as well. I think you've got a lot of, um, you know, seniors who have, um, you know, can't afford to live in that home unless they have the opportunity to rent it out to somebody um, as needed. So um, I think that's a bill that makes an awful lot of sense to me and all serves to expand the housing stock for people who can't afford it otherwise. Uh, thanks. Uh, and then, Josh, I had a question on the SBI stuff. Um, I believe you said it was 31 percent. That's the weekly number, correct? Correct. And... And do you have the cumulative number of where we stand overall um, um, in those? Cumulatively, we're at 24%. And when you're saying we've been increasing, the reality is with the number of shots we're giving out going down, we're giving out 31% of significantly less doses than we were before, right? Um, uh, are, are we catching up on that overall, do you think? Or where are we, you know, when you look at it from a month ago, um, trying to get shots into these, into these zip codes and into these communities? Yeah, I mean, it, it has been improving, as you point out, but you're, you're also right that the progress is slower now. There, there are less people... Um, who have not yet been vaccinated, who are still coming out to get vaccinated. That's why we're working so hard to do the mobile outreach, to make the phone calls, to do the door-to-door -door canvassing, to do the homebound vaccinations, to get the yellow vans out to all these events, to do the trusted messenger forums, uh, all the work that uh, the State Department of Public Health, as well as our partners, um, are out there on the ground every day doing right now. We had a, a meeting. I, I want to give a shout out to the team at Griffin Hospital. In fact, Pat Darmel and his team, we met with them earlier today. They are doing unbelievable work every day out in the field, getting really creative with different approaches, different partnerships out there that's really making a difference. And, you know, that, there's going to be a lot more of that we're going to need to do as we go through the summer. Are the... Um... The grants from the 13, I believe it was 13 million dollars to the local health departments. Are those have those been doled out? Has that program started? Are some of those outreach things already in progress? Have you got any sense how those are going so far, or if they're they've started actually doing stuff on the ground in some of these towns? Yeah, it, it is going. Money is going out, um, and I know a lot of the district are starting to put it to work with uh, different programs and promotions in their communities, hiring some additional uh, people to do canvassing um, and to uh, do outreach to people who haven't been vaccinated yet. So, um, you know, it's uh, important efforts that are going on at the local level that we're, we're thrilled to support and partner. Thanks. All right, I'm getting the signal here. Um, First, uh, thanks to Kim Hawkins, all your help with HEDCO as we try and help people get back to work and uh, what that means. You're going to help them even start up a business and what that means. Um, I'd like to say as we talk about reopening, 
uh, spent the weekend sort of bipolar, two events that remind me a lot of things never stopped. Uh, one group that never stopped during COVID were our firefighters. Our firefighters were uh, out there nonstop throughout. And uh, today it was a, a sad day in New Haven, uh, Ricardo Torres, who died fatally trying to save lives, saving lives in a burning building in New Haven, uh, died at the age of 22 uh, on the job. And it was particularly a moving, you know, for me there uh, with his uh, beautiful wife, Erica, speaking on behalf. I didn't want to marry a hero. I wanted a, a, a great husband who could come home safely, do his job, and then be with wife and kids, and he won't be able to do that. It just reminds you what our amazing public servants, in this case, sorry, with the firefighters do for us every day, even in the midst of COVID. And I was particularly moved by the fact that there are over a thousand firefighters from all over the region, all over the country, showing up in New Haven as brothers and sisters uh, behind what this meant um, to them. And driving back up uh, from New Haven to Hartford over every single uh, bridge, if you saw it, there was the uh, hook and ladder truck dangling the American flag and the firefighters cheering. On a happier note, um, I was at the Coast Guard Academy yesterday. Uh, they didn't get a graduation ceremony uh, last year, and uh, they didn't get the, I don't know if the picture is up here, of the uh, uh, ensigns throwing their hats up like that scene out of Top Gun. Last year, they just got noticed that they were being sent off. They were being sent off to the South China Sea or Persian Gulf, uh, but not yesterday. Yesterday, the President of the United States was there, and again, a ceremonial opening that uh, is part of the rhythm of what... Um, keeps us going as, as, a, as a society. And it was just wonderful seeing those young people shaking those hands, getting their assignment uh, where they were going to be. And finally, um, yesterday was the big reopening, not just in terms of, um, you know, graduations and the such, but also in terms of uh, drinks on us. And we're having a little fun reminding people, um, if you haven't been vaccinated, you're going to have to pay the bill for that drink. Get vaccinated. Max? This is great. We don't have to wear a mask. Only if you've been vaccinated. And free drinks for the meal? Only if you've been vaccinated. Have you tried our new drink, the governor? Hey, where's my governor? Coming right up. Governor for you, and a governor for you, and oh, not vaccinated, eh? Get the jab so you don't get stuck with the tab. Take care, everybody. Be safe.